I'm pre-rolling uh, on the one there. Uh, we're not recording music. We're recording when I need to speak. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Johannes. Yeah, um, so I was, I was delighted when uh, we were able, uh, when I was head of the School of Arts, to be able to, um, <clears throat> to get this building, because it was, uh, the engineers wanted it. And as, as you may know, Brunel University is very famous, uh, has some w a wonderful engineering faculty. And, uh, <clears throat> but luckily, we were able to uh, persuade the Vice-Chancellor to, to back the arts and, and, and research and teaching in, in the arts. And we did name it uh, the Antonin Arto building. It was interesting when we were looking into uh, whether it was possible, because you have to look at clearance, look at family and so on. There was no one from Arto's family uh, none of his lineage was left, but also it was interesting to find out that, that no building in the world is named after Arto, so I was absolutely proud and delighted uh, to make this, this the first one. Um, as Johannes said, I'd, I've been fascinated by Arto's work uh, really since I was uh, quite young and, a, uh, and an undergraduate Dra drama student. And uh, I'll be showing some of my own work in, uh, in multimedia theatre with a company called The Chameleons Group. And we do about a show every four or five years. Not that we're working all the time. Um, it's just, just the way that it's gone. But you're actually seeing work from about, some of it's 17 years old and uh, coming up uh, to, to more recent times. And I'm doing a, another performance with The Chameleons Group uh, at, the end, at the end of April. But you'll see some... Uh, some of my, my own work. Uh, interpreta interpreting Arto uh, is one of those, th those things that everyone does it, does it di uh, differently. So Peter Brooks' Arto is quite different from Julian Beck's or Stephen Burkhoff's or, uh, or Robert Wilson's. Um, so interpretation is, is very key. I'm interested uh, and have a background in comedy, so I mix uh, comedy with, with cruelty in, in some of my multimedia theatre work. Uh, in the paper, it's, got, um, it's about doubles, and I'm very interested in doubles. Um, and, and the paper has a double, if you like, which will be up on the screen. Um, so, and hopefully I will sort of synchronise at times with, with what's going on uh, on the screen. And I'm, I'm looking really at a number of themes. The first is the double than ideas of, uh, of cruelty, but also uh, ideas about film and Arto's relationship with film and some of the wonderful film scenarios uh, he created and, and some of the writings around, around cinema uh, that, 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 he, that he published. Anyway, I will, <coughs> I will start the paper proper. So 
So that was the voice of Anthony Nato a few months before his death in 1948. He'd recently been released from 10 years incarceration in mental institutions where he'd, he'd endured 51 sessions of electroshock therapy, each resulting in a minor coma. No wonder he sounds a little pissed off. It was his last performance, a commissioned radio production that was deemed too disturbing and banned a day before its scheduled French radio broadcast. Arto would be dead within a month. Like so many of Arto's projects, including his film The Shell and the Clergyman that we're seeing here from 1928, it was extreme, ambitious, in your face, visceral, uncompromising, and way ahead of its time. And like a great number of Arto's projects, it failed. We've named this building after a madman and a failure. But of course, like so many iconic figures, his relative failure was only during his lifetime, because later, Arto's time would certainly come. By the, the late 1950s and early, early 1960s, not only, only were his ideas rediscovered, they reignited to burn like a shining beacon, lighting the way towards a new and extraordinary artistic avant-garde. Peter Brook, one of the greatest theatre directors of all time, would champion Arto's theories and aesthetics in productions such as Marat Sard from 1964. This visionary, wrote Brooke, was undoubtedly mad, but wrote more sense about the theatre than anybody else. Arto's theatrical theories have influenced generations of theatre and performance makers, and as Charles Marowitz once put it, quote, the 1930s were stamped by Stanislavski, the 50s by Brecht, and the entire remainder of the century by Arto. Arto was a force of nature and not least as a film actor. Here he is playing the monk in Carl Dreyer's The Passion of Joan of Arc. And from this serene and spiritual role, he went on to play the crazed, bloodthirsty Marat in Abel Gance's seminal film Napoleon. Arto wrote, quote, It was the first part in which I, self, I felt myself as I really am, effervescent, passionate, anguished. I seem to incarnate a force of nature. He then began to write film scenarios and scripts, including The Shell and The Clergyman, one of the first full-length surrealist films directed by Germain Dulac. But typically, Arto was self-destructive. He argued with Dulac over her interpretation and direction and was banned from the editing suite. He then turned up at the film's premiere and unbelievably, he started to shout and heckle. This was at his own first film premiere. By all accounts, Arto was quite a character. The film brought acclaim in France and a ban in the UK, where the British Board of Film Censors said, quote, this film is so cryptic as to be meaningless, and if there is any meaning, it is doubtless objectionable. Arto tried desperately to raise money to direct some of his own films, but to no avail. Another failure. He then returned to the theatre, co-founding the Alfred Jarry Theatre and staging experimental performances. Then, in 1935, he wrote, directed and starred in The Sensi, another failure, at least in commercial terms. His assistant director and acolyte, Roger Blinn, would later become one of France's greatest theatre directors and would forge a close collaboration with Samuel Beckett and direct the premieres of all of Beckett's major plays. In the 1930s, Arto began to formulate his influential theatrical theories that others would later go on to realize. And in 1938, these writings were published together as the theater and its double. And I'm the proud owner of one of the 400 copies of the very first edition. Jean-Louis Barrow called it the single most important book ever written about the theater. Many would agree with this analysis, and it would become an abiding inspiration for the pioneers of experimental theater and performance in the 1960s. Jerzy Grotowski, of course, opened a theater laboratory largely dedicated to following Arto's visions, while the living theater used Arto's ideas on physical hieroglyphs and breaking down the barriers between actors and audiences. Richard Schechner's performance group took up Arto's call to reinvent theatre and would later transform into the Wooster group that we're seeing here. 
These companies followed Arto's lead in making theatre sensory rather than literary, and an experience that directly affects the body and the nervous system, not just the intellect. Theatre suddenly be became a place where something could really happen, and where life and society, perhaps, could be changed. And through the 1970s, 80s and 90s, the great auteur theatre directors like Robert Wilson, Ariane Mnuchkin, Peter Brook, Richard Foreman, Stephen Burkoff and Robert Lepage all drew from Arto a new attitude to spectacle and physicality and a new harnessing of the actor's power. Arto's legacy can also be traced in the emergence of performance art and body art where theatricality is deconstructed and something is not represented but actually takes place. The pulse of Arto also runs through the veins of much contemporary postmodern theatre and dance, from forced entertainment and DV8 to Wim van der Kabus, and we'll see clips of their work as I continue. Arto's spirit also pervades the work of some of the most important recent British playwrights, Howard Barker, Sarah Kane, Anthony Nielsen, Mark Ravenhill. In the 1960s, Arto was held up as an icon and talisman for the age, and his artistic influence knew no bounds. He became patron saint of the beats when writers such as Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg and William Burroughs steeped themselves in his theories. Composers like John Cage and Pierre Boulez also drew inspiration. I can find in his writings, wrote Boulez, quote, the fundamental preoccupations of contemporary music, cries, noises, rhythms, a fusion of sound and word, the vertigo of improvisation, the power of an elementary ritualism, and how to organize delirium. Arto also inspired philosophers of every persuasion, from social philosophers like Foucault to feminist philosophers Kristeva and Sisu. Arto gave Deleuze and Guattari the concept of the body without organs that they would eulogize and make famous. And he stood center stage in the new philosophy of deconstruction when da Derrida wrote an entire book on him. And Arto was deconstruction to his bones. So we've seen some examples of Arto's influence at work and I now want to focus on my own work as director of the Chameleons Group. We try to update Arto's ideas for the digital age and make literal his metaphor of the theatre and its double by doubling the actors by their simultaneous appearances live on stage and recorded on screen. The screen and stage embodiments are in constant battle with each other like schizophrenic personalities. Arto wrote, quote, if theatre doubles life, life doubles the true theatre. And the double of the theatre is the real. The double of theatre is its true and magical self, stirring other dark, primitivist and potent shadows. Arto called for a theatre of cruelty, but his concept of cruelty was complex. This was no Grand Guignol blood and guts. It meant a heightened form of aesthetics using stylized physical and vocal gestures that would shake an audience to its foundation and leave them in awe. It was about actors working with absolute rigor, being cruel to themselves, unmasking themselves. Arto is the voice that asks the serious artist, have you gone far enough? In the theatre in its double, Arto says that acting should be a delirium like the plague. And he conjured an extraordinary vision of the actor as a martyr burned alive, still signalling through the flames. It's a grand metaphor and remains one of the most potent and spiritual articulations of acting theory. Our use of the actor on stage and the double on screen, the performers acting with and against themselves at worst, offers the actor two bites of the cherry and at best opens the possibility of some synergetic alchemy which might approach this notion of flame-licked delirium. so much fear in this place. I have so much fear in this place. I have so much, I have so much fear in this fear in, fear in this place. It offers little comfort. And I beg for forgiveness for my anger. 
It is off. Raging, 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 rage, 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 rage. I have so much fear in this place. How dare you abandon me? How dare you abandon me? I'm horrified. Fear and longing that reduces me to someone else. I am, I am, I am nothing. I am nothing. I have so much fear in this place. It offers little comfort. And I beg for forgiveness for my anger. It is often raging. How dare you abandon me and mould this fear and longing that reduces me to someone else? I am nothing. Arto is best known for his theatrical manifestos on cruelty, but he also had a surrealistic delight in the comedic absurdities of human existence. Arto propounds theories on the disruptive and transformative potentials of what he calls, quote, the power of physical and anarchic dissociation in laughter. We follow both his ideas on cruelty and humour, tempering disturbing imagery with comedy to avoid alienating the audience and to keep them on side. I'll show uh, a short clip illustrating this, and I think it also shows something of the pleasure principle associated with synthesising live actors and screen ones. Just give me more of a chance, let's try again. In this next sequence, the woman on the right uh, is a live performer, and the figure and her double on the left are mediatized. Here, the live actor meets the supposed absence and past tense of her projected double, but it asserts itself as doubly present, both temporally and in terms of equal theatrical presence. So as the real meets the virtual, absence becomes presence, and past becomes present. Now, the concept of the human double has remained a constant factor in folklore and tradition, particularly the belief that every human being is accompanied through life by two extensions of their personality, the one good, the other evil, the former luminous and the latter dark and menacing. Anthropologists have suggested that this derives from a primitive rationalisation, interpreting one's reflected image in water as a shadowy companion spirit. Theatre theorist Matthew Causey has discussed the moment when the double appears and the live actor confronts his or her digital other. Drawing on Freud and Lacan, he suggests that this representation of the self outside itself, the witnessing of the self as other, quote, enacts the subject's annihilation, its nothingness. The uncanny experience of the double is death made material, unavoidable, present screened, end quote. The performer's confrontation with their double is thus the quest for disappearance, a quest for otherness, and Causey presents a quite chilling image of the performer's double as cadaver. Quote, to see oneself is to demolish oneself in an autopsy of perception. 
Now, our confrontations with our doubles in chameleon shows are sometimes these intense demolitions or autopsies of the self. But just as often, they are comedic deconstructions of our characters and ourselves' varied facets. In this scene, we parody the figure of the cyborg to emphasize its comical and schizophrenic nature. So here, my character is a distinctly paranoid cyborg who converse, converses with two different versions of himself. There are therefore two alter ego doubles in this clip, the utopian and messianic mirror boy and the cynical and quite dystopian upside down boy. His metamorphosis is perfect. His hyper-advanced metal body, cunningly disguised by his wasted, paranoid appearance and slight beer gut. Who would have thought he has the strength of a hundred men? Sometimes I feel worse. I have thoughts that just aren't mine. But none of them are yours. You've got to understand. Things are different now. Yes. My limbs are weapons. What with the black and daggers, you fucking penis brain? They are drills of justice and truth. They're for putting up shells. <laughs> I'd now like to focus on the notion of cruelty and Arto's proposal for, quote, a theatre where violent physical images pulverise, mesmerise the audience's sensibility, caught in the drama as if in a vortex of higher forces. Violent and physically cruel images are central to our performances and are particularly evident in the video elements of the pieces. Each performer conceives imagery which either relates to their personal fears, obsessions and dreams, or to those of the characters they portray. For this performance, Chameleons 2, we paid particular attention to Arto's film scenarios and writings. Though we avoided lifting any film images direct from Arto, our imagery was conceived to reflect his own summary of the imagistic content of